A few months ago, I decided to buy a 3D printer. As usual for me, this was a total immersion into something I intended to learn along the way. The printer I chose turned out to be substandard in a number of important areas, so I decided to rebuild it, replace most everything with better components and new designs. Years ago, I designed electronics for the NASA Space Shuttle, so I have the right skills for this kind of project. I was eager to launch my printer into a better space. The rebuilt printer looks much the same from the outside, but its essentials are all new. The original motherboard was supposed to have networking features, but well, it didn't. The original extruder, a key printer component, was badly designed and kept clogging up. And the cabling was too fragile for everyday reality. All this had to go. Here's the project at its height. Yeah, I know it looks pretty crazy, but it has its own internal kind of logic. This is the replacement motherboard. It's a duet to Wi-Fi. It has networking, it has a nice web interface, good controls, very reliable. It has everything that the original motherboard lacked. Notice the ribbon cable in the bottom center. It's a pretty robust ribbon cable with uh, press fit connectors, um, a great replacement for the original flimsy ribbon cable that came with this unit. Here's the cable routing above the print bed. Notice the um, nylon cord and the fishing weight in the corner there. That's a way to keep the cable away from the uh, print bed and other things that could destroy it. It looks kind of hokey, but it works great. Here's a close-up of the counterweight. When you get done laughing, notice that it provides uh, constant force regardless of the position of the cable. It does look kind of ridiculous. This is the new extruder assembly. The mounting is a Thingiverse project, links in the description. The actual extruder is an E3D version 6, a full metal, um, hot end, very reliable. A big improvement over the original. And why is it an improvement? <laughs> Thought you'd never ask. An ideal 3D printing extruder has three zones. Zone 1 mechanically drives the filament toward the hot block. This zone has to be kept cool so the gears can drive a solid filament. If the filament melts here, the gears get fouled up and the extruder stops working. Zone 2, also known as the hot block, melts the filament and moves it toward the printing nozzle. Ideally, transition zone A is a very short distance and a fast temperature change. It's called the heat break. Zone 3 is where the printed model takes shape. The nozzle deposits plastic on the model, which must cool and solidify. If the plastic isn't cooled quickly enough, it can form a solid base for the next layer. Look at these test prints, one without zone 3 cooling and one with. The problem at the left is that the previously deposited layer hadn't solidified before the nozzle began trying to deposit a new layer. What a mess. Here's the original extruder that came with this printer. Pretty, pretty marginal. Over here you can see the fan that's supposed to be responsible for cooling the filament as it goes into the hot block. But it's located so far from where things need to be that it's scarcely able to function. And uh, there's uh, a fixed tension um, grip for the filament, so you can't adjust that. I had all kinds of problems with this uh, extruder when I first got this printer and I assumed it was because I didn't know very much about 3D printing. Imagine my surprise when I discovered the problem was the extruder, not me. Anyway, it was one of the reasons I completely replaced everything. The rebuilt printer works well and handles many different materials. ABS, PETG, TPU, all very well. But nylon, maybe not so great. So I'm happy with the result. There are links with more detail in the description. In the next section, I show some of my printing projects, practical things as well as mathematical curiosities. After a bunch of spectacularly failed experiments and the rebuild project I just described, I was ready to print some useful things. I was curious to see what completely ordinary things I could print, make 3D printing seem like part of real life. There's a widely available, perfectly good bicycle mirror that has a design defect, a terrible mount. 
The mount is a simple rubber strap that you wrap around your handlebars, but it doesn't grip very well and it stretches over time. After it stretches a bit, you go over a bump and the mirror suddenly gives you a view of the ground. I got the idea to design a new mount that would keep the mirror in position. I designed this two-piece clamp with a special fitting for the mirror, printed an ABS for strength, and attached it to my bike, or tried to. This video shows a typical outcome. Some of the clamps lasted longer than this one. I tried printing one in nylon, known for high strength, but all of them broke, either while being mounted or in the field. I needed a more flexible mount. Designing a flexible mirror mount is somewhat of a radical departure. Printing it requires use of flexible TPU filament, which can't be used with printers that have a Bowden setup. A short digression. In a Bowden setup, the filament driving motor is located some distance away from the hot end and nozzle, which makes the moving part of the system lighter and quicker to respond. But the drawback is that this system can't use flexible filaments because the motor is too far from the hot end to control a flexible filament's precise motion through the nozzle. In a direct drive, the filament driving motor is located with the hot end and nozzle. This means more mass is moving around during printing, so the extruder can't easily change direction. But a direct drive can print flexible filaments. My printer is direct drive. Here's my flexible mirror mount as animated by the free, terrific Blender graphics program. I always like to see my designs in the virtual Blender world where everything is perfect and nothing breaks. But back in reality, it was during my effort to print this design that I first found out about filament water absorption. After a few experimental runs, the printer suddenly and mysteriously stopped printing and I couldn't even push the filament through the extruder anymore. At first I was mystified. Then I noticed the filament wasn't the correct diameter. It was too thick to pass through. I did a little research and discovered that I had to thoroughly dry out the filament before use. So I put it in the kitchen oven at a relatively low temperature like 130 degrees Fahrenheit, 55 degrees centigrade, for 12 hours. This solved the problem and I could carry on printing. There's more about filament drying later on in this video. Anyway, this flexible mirror mount tolerates, well, reality. It holds the mirror's position during bumpy mountain bike rides. I don't feel as though I have to be gentle around it lest it fracture into little plastic pieces. And it meets one of my 3D printer goals, being able to design and print silly but useful things. Albert Einstein once said, as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they're not certain. And as far as they're certain, they don't refer to reality. Much has changed since Dr. Einstein's time, and mathematics plays a much larger role in modern life. As just one example, weather forecasting relies very much on mathematics since the time a Scottish weather forecaster is said to have gone outside, observed how high the sheep were grazing on a nearby mountain, and made his forecast based on that. It won't be long before cars start driving themselves, guided by mathematics, and the auto accident death rate descends close to zero. It won't be long before any job that can be automated will be using mathematical algorithms, and society will need to be restructured to take this into account. There are many fascinating applications for math, but my favorite math has no earthly purpose. Once I got my 3D printer to behave itself, I began to think about printing the so-called platonic solids, a group of multi-sided objects known to the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato in particular. Plato imagined a realm of pure forms and ideas, a realm he regarded as more important than boring earthly reality. In that realm lives the platonic solids, which were supposed to represent universal prototypes of earthly objects and ideas. I decided to write and run the equations that describe the platonic solids, then use a computer to design printable representations and see if they could be 3D printed. I came up with two forms. This section deals with solids having vertices and edges but no faces. That comes later. After I wrote code to generate the full classical Greek solid set, I made two additions, a hypercube and a buckyball, shapes that weren't known to the ancient Greeks. The buckyball, technically a truncated icosahedron, is particularly interesting because it's so complex, having 20 hexagonal and 12 pentagonal faces. When Buckminster Fuller first designed it, no one thought there would be anything like it in nature, but it turns out that naturally occurring carbon-60 takes this shape. 
I generate this version of the Platonic Solids with a Python computer program that does the mathematical heavy lifting. Then I run the results through Blender to get printable files. Then I print them with results of varying quality. The problem with printing these objects is they violate one of the basic rules of 3D printing, avoid overhangs. It turns out these objects all have overhangs of varying degrees of severity, and the printed results show artifacts of this defect. Aware of the overhang issue, I added supports to the models, but so many supports were needed that they became the problem, so I gave up on that idea and let the printer try to print the overhangs. The result was a defective model with gaps in its surfaces and general roughness in those areas that were more than 45 degrees away from the vertical, which for a platonic solid meant about half the edges. The undersides of some horizontal spans showed gaps in the plastic. As a result, the least flattering, most revealing thing was to flip such a model over so the part that had been nearest the print bed was on top. This showed all the model's defects. This was a classic collision between the abstract mathematical realm and reality, and I tried to think of a way to bring more of math's perfection to my models. Then I realized if I could design a polygon face, like a triangle or a pentagon, one that could be assembled into a solid, then only a few face types would be needed to build all the platonic solids, and because the faces were flat, they would 3D print more easily. But to make a solid, the faces had to join together at the edges. I tried to think of a way to connect one face edge to another. This wasn't an easy problem. Any face edge had to easily attach to another, regardless of orientation, and the connection had to be able to rotate or hinge along the connected edge. I needed a universal connector, not a plug nor a socket, but something that was both at once. After some thought, I came up with this solution, a universal connector. The connector is printed onto each edge of a polygon, and the polygons can then be assembled by snapping them together. Only one connector type is needed, and it attaches to any other connector of the same kind. The connection is also a hinge. This is needed to build a platonic solid that has angles between its faces. I designed the three polygon types I needed, triangle, pentagon, hexagon, added my universal connector to each edge, and started printing a lot of copies. This was much easier than printing a single model for each platonic solid, and the polygons could be reused to build other shapes. Here's a test assembly of some early parts. Uh, I used 6 millimeter thickness on these parts and fairly robust dimensions overall because what I discovered was that parts didn't last very long if they were smaller or lighter. Uh, and so a certain minimum size was required. This ended up having some consequences later on when I started building larger platonic solids. Here I am assembling the icosahedron, which is a, which requires 20 triangles at a 10 to 1 speed up. That way you can't see all the mistakes I'm making. Um, this was a great test of the robustness of these parts. Again, I wanted to emphasize these are um, 6 millimeter thick uh, plastic parts. I just went that way because I realized if I assembled and disassembled them several times, it would keep them from wearing out quite so quickly. You can see a little bit of snow on the on the black surface beneath the... Uh, that's the stuff that's falling off the connectors just because of wear and tear. Well, you heard me say these parts were pretty strong, six millimeters uh, thickness and all. Here's the proof. This is the toolbox test. I just plant my heavy toolbox on top of this icosahedron that snapped together with my little edge connectors. And it seems to survive the experience. Surprise, surprise. Here I assembled the dodecahedron, which consists of 12 pentagons. These same pentagons become part of the giant buckyball coming up next. Okay, here I am assembling the much larger buckyball, which consists of 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons, all the pentagons that were used earlier to create the dodecahedron. This is much larger than I expected it to be. Uh, early in the project, I settled on minimum dimensions for strength and other considerations, and in order for the parts to fit together, they all had to have the same edge length. 
Well, they got to the buckyball part and well, it was a bit bigger than I expected. It's 14 and a half inches tall, 37 centimeters. And it's quite remarkably large. In this final section, I discuss some precautions in 3D printing, things to do and to avoid, mostly having to do with the rate at which printing filaments absorb water, which if not corrected has a number of consequences, all of them bad. Early on I saw some part failures that shouldn't have happened, so I did some research and realized that wet filament cannot produce strong parts. It's as simple as that. Let's start with my microscope images. This is a 40 times magnification microscope image of a nylon part that failed unexpectedly. It shows many gas pockets and voids and irregular spacing between the 3D printed layers, including some open gaps where one layer isn't fused to another. This is caused by water absorbed in the filament, something nylon is particularly prone to. When this filament gets to the extruder hot end, the water boils and turns to steam. This creates gas pockets as well as preventing the printer from creating layers that properly fuse to one another. Here's the same part, but this time printed with nylon that was dried out, desiccated, for 12 hours in advance. In this image, I deliberately located a gas pocket to make a point, which is, after you dry out nylon and mount it on the printer, it promptly begins absorbing water again, so without extraordinary precautions, one cannot completely avoid water absorption issues. Here's one of my filament storage bins. The idea is I just put all the, the reels inside this bin along with a cup of silica to absorb moisture. That's the silica right there. And then close it up. If it was airtight, it would be pretty effective, but this particular container is only approximately airtight. What that means is the silica has to be um, dried out from time to time to retain its effectiveness. This is what silica looks like when it needs to be dried out, when it's no longer functional. Here's my drying apparatus. It's a repurposed food drying tool. Uh, I put the silica into this dryer from time to time to dry them out and get them uh, reactivated. I also do the same thing with some reels of filament in advance of an important print. Here's what the silica looks like after it's been completely dried out. Uh, most silica products have the same self-indicating feature. In many cases, right before a, an important print, I'll dry out the filament itself uh, for 12 hours just to make sure things are nice and dried out. The uh, silica approach is for long-term storage, but uh, if it's an important print, you're better off drying the filament directly. This printer came with some metal sheets and a magnetic print bed. Nice idea, the sheets stick to the print bed. But the sheets wore down quickly and were no longer flat and level. 3D printing requires a perfectly level print surface. After experimenting with different surfaces, I settled on a strong sheet of borosilicate glass. But I taped the glass to a metal plate so I could keep the magnetic mount feature. I hope this video has been fun and educational. All the resources are linked in the description. Here's my favorite joke. Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? Great food, no atmosphere. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.